my name is Clint Gilchrist. I'm the executive director of the Museum of the Mountain Man. We're located in Pinedale, Wyoming, and we interpret the short history of the Mountain Man period here, in the rendezvous period in the 1820s and 1830s. So I, I talk a little bit about the Mountain Man period. Um, in after Lewis and Clark came back from their trip out to the West Coast, um, they came to St. Louis and said, "Hey, there's beaver up there." Um, everybody in the East and Europe wanted fancy hats, uh, top hats that were made out of beaver. And so this was almost like a gold rush to come and get that beaver, the beaver pelts. So young men out of St. Louis came up to the mountains to trap beaver. Once they figured out where to trap in the central region, um, they, it was a thousand miles to go back to St. Louis. It was a three month trip. And so they didn't, they had to stay year round in the mountains instead of traveling back and forth every year. Uh, so they lived up here. They were the first non-natives to live year round in the mountains. Uh, we're talking at a time when there was probably 100,000 Indians and maybe a few hundred mountain men. So they very much wanted to work with the Indians. Um, they, uh, once a year, a supply caravan would come from St. Louis and would bring supplies and take the furs back. Um, where they met to do that trading was called a rendezvous, and there were 16 rendezvous held one each year from 19, 1825 to 1840. Um, and the first one of those rendezvous was just kind of a quick exchange goods. After that, they realized, hey, this is a great time to have a party and have some fun. They brought alcohol, and those turned into lavish parties. Uh, and so they're the most iconic part of this era is, is the rendezvous. Uh, six of the 16 were held just close here to Pine and Wyoming. That's why we have this museum here. So the mountain men, um, they kind of blazed some of the trails. They didn't really create the trails because the trails were here from, from the natives that had been using them for a long time. But generally rivers were the, the corridors to travel in the west at that time. And so coming from St. Louis, the mountain man kind of established a new set of trails to get from St. Louis to get to the mountains, which ultimately would become the Oregon California trail system for, that the immigrants used. Um, they would primarily use mules, uh, sometimes wagons, uh, but wagons were really hard once they got off the plains, and so they might use carts uh, in the mountains, but most of the time it was mules. Um, it would take them, they could travel maybe 20 miles a day. It would take them three months to get here from St. Louis. So names that people might have heard of some of the famous mountain men. All these guys were young men. They came in, they were in their, their 20s and 30s. Uh, one of the most famous is Jim Bridger. Uh, he would, the first, the first group that come up into the mountains that in the 1822-1823 time frame, he was the youngest mountain man at the time. He was just the kid. But he ended up here, staying up here his entire life. Uh, he went to all 16 of the rendezvous. And by the last rendezvous in 1840, he was the old man at a grand age of 36 years old. <laughs> so it, they, it, was a, it was a fairly young, active group of, of adventurous young men that came up here and trapped and, and sent the pelts back. Um, other mountain man, Jed Smith was another really famous mountain man. Um, he was kind of the pathfinder. He was the one that came up here and found the new ground and searched out new beaver area. Uh, so this is a two-wheel cart, a charrette, or a Red River cart, as the mountain man would call them. Uh, the mountain man learned pretty early coming. Uh, the mountain man, as they traveled around, did not use carts. They just basically used horses and mules. But when the supply caravans would come up from St. Louis and came along that trail along the Platte River, um, they would bring wagons and carts. One year at, one, at the rendezvous, they brought wagons. Very maneuverable, you could pull them with one. Usually two mules would pull them, but you could even pull them with one. You could float them across some rivers, like the Platte River, um, as long as it wasn't too far, uh, so that they wouldn't start getting waterlogged. Um, one thing you'll notice about this cart is it doesn't have any metal in it, and so that was for repair purposes out on the plains. There was nobody out here to help them uh, fix these carts so this has a buffalo skin instead of a metal tire holding the wheel together. Um, not as good for use but it's much better for repair because you can repair it in the field when you're a long ways away from any blacksmith. 
the entire fur trade of the West and the Rocky Mountain fur trade was, was driven by the, the fashion trends of the East and Europe, and that included a top hat, like this dandy that we have here is wearing. Uh, every, there's, there's pictures from the era of the early, late 1700s, early 1800s of cities in the East or cities in Europe where almost everybody's wearing a hat just like that. Uh, the best fur for those hats was beaver fur. They would cut the felt off, or they cut the under fur off of the pelt and mat it together to create a felt, and then they would create these hats. They were very much a for, uh, for fashion and not for function as much, um, but everybody had to have one, so there was a lot of money in it, and that's what drove the, the fur trade. Um, one of the most prized possessions we have in the museum is Jim Bridger's rifle. It's really unusual to get artifacts that were in the hands of those mountain men because it was almost 200 years ago and pretty much everything that they had on their daily lives was pretty much used up and, and doesn't exist anymore. But to have a rifle, there's only two of Jim Bridger's rifles known. This was one that was uh, given to him by his partner, Louis Vasquez. They're the two that started Fort Bridger. Um, Louis Vasquez had this commissioned in 1853 and gave it to Jim Bridger. We don't know why or what was the occasion, but if you look right on the stock and the, the eagle inlay there, it says J. Bridger, 1853.